Stand with us, will you please, as we sing about our Lord Jesus Christ and the cross upon which he suffered for you and me as we sing at the cross. Together. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I At the cross, at the cross Where I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the day Was it for crimes that I had done, he rode upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first 
saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Oh, the cross, oh, the cross, Lord, I thank you for the cross. Oh, the cross, oh, the cross, Lord, I thank you for the cross. But try grief and every pain, the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Oh, the cross, oh, the cross, Lord, I thank you for the a moment and sing another great song, but I hope you'll greet someone nearby and let them know you're glad to see them here today at the youth conference. Let's sing about the grace of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This song says, One Day. One day when heaven was filled with His praises, One day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is He. The Word became flesh and the light shined among us, His glory revealed. Living He loved me, dying He saved me, buried He sins far away, rising me justified, freely forever, one day He's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. 
for that promise that you are coming again. And these moments of youth conference have gone by so quickly, and really life goes by awfully quick, and one day we will be with you. And so, Lord, today in this service, may you prepare our hearts in whatever way is needed to prepare for your coming. If you should give us another day or if you should give us an entire lifetime, may it be dedicated to serving you. I pray that as we listen today, that we'll listen not just with our ears, but with our hearts. And Lord, may we then act with our feet as we go from this place to live for you who died for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Joshua Camps is a summer camp experience like no other. It's a week-long adventure for students entering 7th through 12th grade on the campus of West Coast Baptist College.
at Joshua Camps, you will be challenged to discover your God and develop your gifts. You will experience dynamic preaching, epic games, and more. You can pick one of 10 specialty skill areas and get ready for a week of learning, excitement, and spiritual growth. Register today at joshuacamps.com.
been said that all of us see, but not everybody observes. We all see the same things, but we don't always stop and observe what we see. You've been around a lot of teenagers this week, as I have, and I've seen a lot of teenagers, more than I've seen in a while. But you know what I've observed? I've observed a lot of adults, too. Pastors, youth pastors, bus drivers, lay people from churches that gave up a week of vacation. I've walked through the parking lots and I've seen some of the nicest church buses I've ever seen in my life. Somebody's put a lot of money into teenagers. You say, ours will probably break down on the way home, Brother Gatch. Well, isn't it wonderful that people are putting something into your life? I hope you observe that. When you get back home, just think about how much your church, your pastor, your staff, your deacons put into the lives of boys and girls and young people. Why do they do that? Around here, you've seen a lot of things, but maybe you didn't observe a kid's city building just completed recently. Millions of dollars poured into that building. Why? Because there's a pastor that's about to preach to you that's passionate about the next generation. Why would we do a youth conference? We don't need a whole lot more on our schedule around here. We tend to stay a little busy. But we've kind of stopped everything this week and poured tens of thousands of dollars into a conference. Why? Because you're about to hear a man that's passionate about teenagers. You've seen college buildings, the Walter Center, the Revels Building, the dormitories. They wouldn't be here. We wouldn't need them if we didn't have a pastor who is passionate about young adults getting trained to serve God with their life. And so I just ask you in these next few minutes, as Pastor Chapel comes to preach this final service of youth conference, okay, there's the old guy. He's got a Bible. He's got a sermon. He's going to preach. And then we're going to leave. Observe something. Observe something, young people. There's someone trying to invest in your life because you're important. You're important to God. You're important to Christianity in the years ahead. Give your heart and your mind these next few minutes to Pastor Chapel as he comes to preach this final service of Youth Conference. Thank you, Dr. Getch. Well, it's great to see all of you this morning. How many of you enjoyed Notch yesterday? Did you enjoy that? Awesome. And how was the service last night? I saw some pictures of it. It looked awesome there, and uh, we filled that place up, and I'm so thankful that we can have memories like that, and I was praying all through the service that God would touch hearts, and we are glad that you're here, and we are asking the Lord to work in hearts. Let's stand together right now, and let's take our Bibles and turn, if you would, to the book of Isaiah. And I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 1 for our message. And I do hope that you uh, enjoyed uh, Knott's Berry Farm yesterday. And actually, we'll turn to Isaiah 6. We'll be in Isaiah 1 a little bit in just a minute. But we'll start reading in a moment in Isaiah chapter 6. How many of you are just a little bit tired today? Let me see. Anybody like that? Ah, all right. Well, you're allowed to be tired. You put in a lot of hours the last few days. And uh, we're praying that you have a great uh, trip home. And let me encourage you, as Brother Getz just said a moment ago, when you get home, uh, be sure to thank your pastor. If your pastor's here, thank him now. Thank him for the vision for teenagers, that, that he would send you all the way over here from so many states. And, and uh, be sure to thank your parents and, and uh, just uh, share with them the things that God is doing in your heart. And youth workers and pastors, thank you uh, for taking the time to invest in the next generation. I know a bunch of you are tired this morning. Kind of reminds me of a little guy that 
went into a shopping center and, and uh, he was just a young teenager, walked into the shopping center and, and uh, he was uh, buying some detergent. He bought a big box of Tide and uh, he was walking towards the cash register and the manager said, son, what are you doing with all that soap? And uh, he said, well, he said, I'm gonna, I need to, I need to wash my cat. And the manager said, well, uh, you might not want to use that. That could be dangerous. That could really uh, hurt the cat if you use that. And the young man kind of brushed it off and went on his way. He came back into the store the next day, and his head was down. He looked pretty sorrowful. And, and uh, the store manager said, son, what's wrong? How come you're so forlorn today? And the boy said, well, my cat died. And the manager said, I told you not to use that tide. And he said, it wasn't the tide that got him. It was the spin cycle that got him. <laughs> and uh, some of our youth pastors feel like they've been through the spin cycle today, don't you? And uh, we hope that you're refreshed and, and have a great weekend when you get back home. I want you to read with me from Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse number 1, as we learn about what it really means to surrender to God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal, in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Let's say that last phrase together. Here am I. Ready? Here am I. Send me. One more time. Here am I. Send me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the safety and for the way that your uh, Holy Spirit has worked in hearts. Thank you for the safety in travels. Thank you for the spiritual work that has been done. I thank you for the many teens that have been saved these last few days. Lord, would you help every student here to recognize that you have a purpose for their life. And it doesn't matter if their family life has been difficult. It doesn't matter if they have attended a Christian school, a public school, a home school, that whatever their background, whatever their family structure, that you want to use all of that to bring them into a place of greater purpose for your life. So help them, Lord, each one, to have a life surrendered to you and teach us what that really means from the Bible today. And I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament prophets were men who were passionate about the holiness of God. Isaiah lived in a day in the southern kingdom of Israel, or in Judah, which was a time of trouble and a time of great sin for the people of God. The nation was truly in trouble, as was indicated in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 4, where Isaiah wrote, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger and have gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. Your whole head is sick. And the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even under the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. God said, when I look 
at the people of Judah, I see a people that are sin sick from the head to the toe. They are corrupt. Their lives bring no glory to God. And Isaiah realized that while the children of Israel had prospered materially, they were in terrible condition spiritually. The economic growth and temporary peace that they had seen in Judah was really just a veneer covering a sickness within the lives of the people of God. The Bible tells us similar conditions will exist in the day in which we live. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, This know also that in the last day perilous times will come. The word perilous means an unraveling from the top to the bottom. And we certainly have seen in our country, the United States of America, an unraveling happening from the top to the bottom. I never saw, I never thought I would see the day when the president of our country uh, would assign funds uh, to allow 10-year-old children, 10-year-old little girls to have mastectomies and 10-year-old little boys to have surgeries so that they could uh, change their sex. But our country not only condones such perversion, it pays for it in the United States. States of America today. And by the way, God's Word is very clear that God created male and female in the image of God. And yet our country's forgetting basic things uh, such as this. And we're seeing an unraveling from the top to the bottom. We're seeing uh, drugs uh, that should not be legalized being legalized. We're seeing uh, lifestyles that are sinful and that are wicked uh, being condoned. And this know that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce break false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. And we see all of this happening in our society today. And so it was for Isaiah. He saw it in Judah. We see it in our day. And in the midst of that ungodly culture, Isaiah found himself standing before a holy God. He saw himself in need first and foremost. And then he saw his people in need as well. When you come to Isaiah 6, I want you to notice in verse 1 a very special moment that every one of us need to have in our own lives. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. Now, I do not mean to insinuate that we will experience the same experience in the exactness of Isaiah's experience in literally seeing the Lord high and lifted up. But all of us need times in our life when through the Word of God, when through preaching and prayer, we come face to face with the fact that God is a holy God and that God has a purpose for our lives. I wonder, have you ever contemplated something so amazing, so of God, that it just sort of took your breath away? That you had to step back and think, whoa, what is this? I, I remember the very uh, first time that I uh, saw the Grand Canyon. I've been there many times since. And just the way that it, it kind of takes your breath away, looking across the vastness of what God created. And you just seem to stand at a place like that and contemplate His greatness. I remember uh, the first time as a young boy seeing the Rocky Mountains and I try to go back and see them every year and spend some time. And one of the things I do is I just look up and I'm amazed at God's power and God's greatness and, and it just kind of takes my breath away to think of how great God is. A few years ago, my wife and I traveled over to the country of Jordan, not far from Israel, and we saw a place called Petra, and I'd seen many pictures of it, and you stand and, and you see something like this, and, and uh, the mausoleum of those uh, that were buried many thousands of years ago, and how they carved all of this rock, and, and you see beautiful uh, things of this nature, and, and you contemplate it, and it kind of captures your attention. Well, I want you to imagine in the life of Isaiah, the Bible tells us that I saw the Lord. Isaiah uh, saw the Lord. And we see that God lifted Isaiah's eyes from himself and from the people. And he first wanted Isaiah to get a glimpse of himself. He saw, the Bible says, the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. As Isaiah saw the Lord, he saw the sovereignty of God. 
He saw that the Lord was truly still in power. He saw that the Lord still had authority over all of his creation. And I want you to take note in verse 1, it says, in the year that King Uzziah died. Please take note of this fact. Kings and kingdoms will die away, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we are not calling you in this conference to serve a company or to serve a denomination or to serve an earthly kingdom. We are calling you to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he saw the Lord in his power and in his sovereignty. Psalm 90 and verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art. God. Psalm 93 and verse 1, the Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength wherewith he girded himself. The world also is established and that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord is on high, mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. He is high and lifted up. And in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah the prophet saw this vision of God. He saw the sovereignty of God. He saw the holiness of God. The Bible tells us that God was high and lifted up because He is a holy God. Thank God today that we serve a living holy God. We do not worship idols made of stone. We do not worship the stars. We do not worship the earth goddess Gaia. We do not worship the environment. We do not worship the animals. We worship the creator of all these things. He is high and lifted up. Psalm 99 and verse 5, Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Psalm 99 and verse 9, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God. God is a holy God. The seraphims promote and protect the holiness of God. And the Bible tells us they covered their faces because of the holiness of God. Psalm 145, 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. I want you to be reminded this morning of the fact that our God is a holy God. We ought not to use his name in vain. Many people today, the only time they say Jesus is in the form of a curse word. The only time they say the name of God is in the form of some type of cursing. Never forget that our God is a holy God, high and lifted up and worthy of our praise. And we see Isaiah's vision of God. He saw the Lord. He heard the seraphim. The Bible says in verse 3, they cried one to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. They gave praise to Him. And they gave praise to God because of who He is. Numbers 23 and 19 says, God is not a man that He should lie, neither the Son of man that He should repent. He hath said, and shall, shall He not do it? Or hath He spoken, and shall He not make it good? I'm thankful today that I serve a God that I can know, and that I can trust, and that I can believe. And He is not a man. He is high and lifted up. And so they uh, sang to him because uh, of who he is. But they also gave praise to him because of what he has done. Because of the things that he has done. I think of what God has done in creation. The Bible is gl very clear. Colossians 1 and verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Think of that today. All of the planetary systems. Think about all of the stars and all of the planets and all of it held together by the mighty power of the God I preached to you about this morning. Psalm 319, the Lord... 
by wisdom, Proverbs 3.19. The Lord, by wisdom, hath founded the earth. Our God has created and sustains the very planet that we live on today. And I'm thankful that I know that. I understand that there are others that have an opposing thought, a satanic opinion. They believe that some billions and billions and billions of years ago, there was some kind of a big bang, and somehow this one-celled amoeba uh, found its way into the oceans of water, and billions and billions of years later, it turned into a fish, and billions and billions and billions of years later, it crawled up onto the seaside, and billions of years later, it turned into a monkey, and billions of years later, it was swinging from a tree, and his tail fell off, and he fell down and hit his head and turned into a professor at USC. I understand there are some people who teach that. But I thank God, I like what B.R. Lakin used to say, I ain't no kin to the monkey, the monkey's no kin to me. I don't know much about your ancestors, but mine didn't hang from a tree. I believe in a literal creation. I believe that God is the creator. I have a God so powerful that he can say, let there be light. And there was light. I have a God so powerful that he can create the waters and he can create the mountains. He has created the heavens. And oh, we worship him because of what he has done in creation. But I worship him for a greater reason than even that. I worship God because of what he has done in redemption. I'm so thankful today that God took the form of a man. I am saying to you this morning, I am thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was conceived of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary and that he was born in this world, that he lived a perfectly sinless life for 33 and a half years, that he was tempted in all points like we are and yet he never sinned and that when he went to the cross of Calvary and he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, that blood, that sinless blood provided the atonement for the sins of all who would believe on the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the Bible says in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Somebody ought to praise God for redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up the sovereign God, the creator God, the savior of the world. And I'm going to say to you, let the rock and roll crowd and let the homosexual crowd praise their gods and they have them. But we ought to praise the living God today and thank him for what he has done. We have a wonderful God. And I'm so thankful today that we would take this time apart, yes, to have some fun, but more than that, to worship our God. Isaiah contemplated this. Isaiah's contemplation, I saw the Lord. And like one would contemplate the Grand Canyon or the Rocky Mountains, he stopped and he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. That ought to be our prayer when we come to the youth group. Hey, not only that we see a friend, somebody help me here. Not only that we see some nice uh, skits, not only that we see some fun things, but most of all, we ought to come to church saying, I want to see God today. And blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Isaiah contemplated the greatness of his God. But I want you to see, secondly, I want you to see Isaiah's conviction. Something happened to Isaiah when he saw the Lord. Something that needs to happen to us. Verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me. Woe is me. I believe when you really see who God is and what he's done for you, it will change your life. It will change your opinion of yourself. It will change your opinion of even God himself. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Here we see Isaiah coming under conviction for his condition. Isaiah realizes that now uh, he is a sinner. He said, woe is me. So many times we can come to a conference like this or we can come to church and even preachers can go to conferences and youth pastors and we can come into the conference thinking we're okay. We think that we're, we're about where we need to be spiritually. 
Uh, we, we think that, you know, we've been in church, we go to a Christian school, mom and dad are saved, whatever we might think. We went to a, a Bible college, so, so I'm okay. But I'm telling you, when you get closer to God, you realize there are some things in your life that need to be dealt with. Isaiah realized that. Woe is me, he said, for I am undone. The word woe is a passionate cry of grief or despair. He said, in the light of God's holiness... I see that I'm not where I need to be spiritually. A vision or a look at God gives a man a clearer picture of himself. In the light of the holiness of God, Isaiah says, I am undone. Hey, I don't really have it all together. And we see sometimes people that want to act like they've got it all together. They got that little strut. They got that little wardrobe going on. They've got this, this new toy or that new thing. And, and they think that's what makes the man. But when you get closer to God and you stand in the presence of God, you're not, you're gonna, not going to impress God with your clothing. You're not going to impress God uh, with your pedigree. You're not going to impress God uh, with your uh, brand new Bible. Listen, God sees the heart. And Isaiah knew that. And Isaiah said, woe is me. I'm undone. I, I'm a man of unclean lips. So often we think we've got it all together. Proverbs 21, 2, every way of man is right in his own eyes. We can be involved in sinful lifestyles and justify it and say, God understands this. Let me tell you something. God hates sin. Amen. He hates it all day, every day. He's a holy, righteous God. And Isaiah is filled with grief and conviction as he stood before the Lord. The Bible says in verse 5, I am a man of unclean lips. He, he said, I, my, my life is not right before God. Romans describes us in the same way, Romans 3 and 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of their way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues have they used deceit, and the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, and their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And many times we live as though the Lord does not even exist. Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And when I saw him, I realized where I really was spiritually. I realized that I, I was undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. But notice, if you would, and thank God for verse number 6. The Bible says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it on my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Once we understand our condition, if we want a cleansing, there is a fountain filled with blood, Amen. drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Whether that is in respect to being saved or whether that is in respect to repenting of sin after we are saved, I'm thankful that that blood is efficacy. It works. It's constantly available, providing the cleansing of sin. And the Bible says, if we will confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we see that there are these moments uh, whereby Isaiah comes and with a heart of repentance, he says, God, I'm a sinner. I, I understand it. I'm a man of unclean lips and the Bible says a live coal is brought down and it is laid upon the mouth of Isaiah and there is a cleansing there is a taking away of iniquity notice it says in verse 7 thine iniquity is taken away how many of you are thankful that your iniquity has been taken away by the blood of Jesus Christ in this moment in Isaiah's life we see the symbolism of a cleansing by fire. We are reminded of the cleansing of the blood. Psalm 103 and verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. Teenagers, let me tell you something quickly. Conviction is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. When God convicts you of your sin, don't relabel that and call it guilt. Don't call it a guilt trip. 
No real godly preacher wants to just put guilt trips on everybody. We want to preach the truth. And when we preach the truth and God convicts your heart, thank God that you still feel that. There are some people, the Bible says, who have something called a seared conscience. Like when you burn your thumb on the stove at home and and it kind of scars up and it gets hard and tough. You poke it with a pin. You can't even feel it. You don't want to be that way with God. You want to be able to feel God's Spirit. Thank God that Isaiah could say, Woe is me. I'm wrong. I need to be right. Thank God that in His grace He sent the the coal to His lips and purified. And by the way, it's a wonderful thing when someone says in a service or in their devotions, they say, whoa, I didn't realize I've been wrong in that area. God, Father, forgive me. I'm going to confess my sin. And He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't have that seared conscience. Keep that tender heart. Keep a heart like Isaiah who realized that he had a need. Isaiah contemplates God. He has a somber contemplation followed by a real conviction. And in that moment of conviction, he turns to God and God cleanses him and prays God for his grace. But I want you to see finally this morning Isaiah's calling. Isaiah's calling. And I want you to understand that God had been working in Isaiah's life to bring him to the moment we're about to read about. The Bible says in verse number 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? All of this is in the context of Judah being fallen, uh, uh, being a putrefied nation, being a corrupt people lost in their sin. And God said, Who shall I send and who will go for us? A reference to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three in one. Who will go for us, God says. Isaiah's calling. I see in this verse number eight, there is a call to go. Isaiah has become thoroughly right with God. It is my prayer that the majority of you in this room, having heard the sermons you've heard the last few days, are closer to God now than when you arrived here a few days ago. And having been saved and having made decisions and having repented of sin, perhaps there would be some in this room who now can hear God's call. You wouldn't have heard it when you first got here. The music was too loud. You were too interested in worldly things. But perhaps God's been touching your heart. Perhaps there's some things been going on. Now God's got a question for you. Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? It's a call to the people. God is asking for some ambassadors, someone that will represent him. An ambassador, according to the book of 2 Corinthians, we read about God's people being ambassadors. That's one who goes from one sovereign power to another, representing the affairs of the one that sent him. That is to say, God is looking for men and women today who will go to one city after another to represent heaven in that city. And he says to Isaiah, Who will go for us? In his reference, no doubt, was the southern Judah, southern kingdom of Judah. Who will go for us? Who who will go to Judah? Isaiah, now that you're right, now that your lips have been purified and your life is purified, uh, who will go and tell them that they are rotten to the core? Who will call this nation to repentance? Who will go for us? I believe the same question could be asked of the country in which we live today, the United States of America. Who will go for us, God would say? Whom shall I send? Who will pastor the next church as the pastor retires? And who will be the next youth pastor? And who will be the next Christian school teacher? And who will be the next evangelist? And who will be the next missionary? Uh, Whom, who? shall I send and who will go for us to this nation that is rotting spiritually 
to this nation that has set apart and sanctified gay marriage to this nation that is full of methamphetamine to this nation that continually seeks another way to take the life of an unborn baby even to the ninth month in this nation that has rejected church and that worships sex and worships sports in this nation that lifts up Taylor Swift and puts down the men of God in this corrupt nation whom will go for me God says I think of the world in which we live. Seven or eight billion people. And God's question today, very simply, whom shall I send? Who will go to Africa? Who will go to Asia? Who will go to Europe? Who will go to Scotland? Who will go to Cameroon? Who will go to the Philippines? Who will go to South Africa? Who will go and whom shall I send? People today need the Lord desperately. The average Christian teenager is not even thinking about this call. They've they've not even heard it many times. The average Christian teenager thinks they've, they've done God a favor if they go to a liberal arts program that's somewhat Christian in nature so that they can get their degree and make their money. That's not what God is referencing here. God is referencing the kind of a call that is dedicated to the propagation of His truth, living your life for the truth, spreading the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I read the story this past week of a young woman by the name of Zariah. She's 28 years old. She lives in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a little bit ahead of America in its post-Christianity stage. One of the ways that they're ahead or maybe behind morally is that they are very involved in euthanasia. Not just abortion, not just taking the lives of children in their mother's womb, but someone gets a little elderly, they're they're proposed to have a euthanasia to to take their life, murder. This young lady is 28 years old. She has some mental illness. She takes some medicines to try to chemically balance some things, but really she she lives at her house. She has a cat. She, she has somewhat of a normal life, just sometimes depression plagues her. And her psychiatrist suggested to her last month that maybe a good way to handle depression would be to take her own life, just to go ahead and end it. After all, euthanasia is available in the Netherlands, she was told. She wrote in the article I read, She said, I am a little afraid of it, but I've gone ahead and made my appointment for death. By the way, her appointment for death is today. I read the article last Friday, her euthanasia this Friday, and this is what she said. I'm a little afraid Because death is the ultimate unknown. Now, first of all, that doesn't sound like a real crazy person to me. Sounds like someone who's rationalizing some things. Secondly, she says, I'm a little afraid because death is the ultimate unknown. Now, teenagers, listen to me. This is why we must answer the call of God. Whom shall I send and who will go for me? Somebody needs to tell Zariah that death is not the ultimate unknown. The Word of God declares it is known. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. There is a place called heaven. There is a place called hell. There is a lake of fire. And those without Jesus will burn there. And there is a place called heaven, a place of many mansions, a place with the presence of Jesus. And those who trust Jesus will spend eternity there. And if there's no heaven, and if there's no hell, I don't ever want to have another youth conference I don't want another late night of study or prayer. I don't need to be involved in the ministry. If there's no heaven, if there's no hell, let's live for ourselves. But if there's a heaven and there's a hell, somebody needs to answer the call of God. She calls it the great unknown. It's not the great unknown. It is revealed. The Bible is the book 
of divine revelation. It has been revealed for God so loved the world. Unfortunately, I don't know of any Baptist missionaries in the Netherlands to even contact Zariah, but the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, Zariah, it is not unknown. It is known there is a God in heaven. There is a home for those who believe. But how shall they hear if they have not a preacher? And how shall he preach except he be sent? Oh, do you understand the call of God? The call, Isaiah's calling It was a calling to a people in great need. It was a call to go for God. Notice that he says in verse number 8, who will go for us? Who will represent us? God has in every generation called people to do his work. I don't really understand why he could have done it without me. He could have done it without you. But God chooses to use human instrumentality in his work. Uh, He could have assigned this work to the angels. He could have just created us as already having been saved. But he gave Adam and Eve a free will. He gave you a free will. He's giving this woman in the Netherlands a free will. Everyone must make their decision about Jesus Christ of their own free will. I think about this. God is calling for us to represent him as ambassadors. I think about the prayers of Jesus. Jesus had one prayer request. It's kind of amazing in the New Testament. One prayer request. I I don't know about you. When someone comes to me with a prayer request, I take it seriously. Sometimes I stop right there and pray with them. One of our men emailed me this morning. He said, Pastor, I have a large business deal in Washington, D.C. today. Pray for me. And I just stopped, and I prayed for him right there. Sometimes people come to me, and they'll say, and you can see a tear in their eye or a trembling lip, and they'll say, would you please pray with me? My mother has cancer. My husband left last night. I don't know about you. I take prayer requests seriously. I remember when my son Larry had cancer. He's been leading this conference. I remember the year he preached here in this conference with his hair, his hair completely gone because of the chemo. I remember those days in Larry's life. Everybody that I would see, I would tell them, could I share a prayer request with you? Please pray for my son, Larry. I want God to use him. Pray that God would spare his life. I'm so glad that people prayed with me and that God has spared his life. Jesus just had one prayer request, teenagers. I I know our time is short. I won't be much longer, but I want to tell you what his prayer request is. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The one thing Jesus tells us to pray for is laborers to go into the harvest. I'm not just preaching this to teenagers. I may be preaching this to youth workers or parents. Every one of us need to be willing to say, Lord, here am I. Here am I. Jesus said, I've got this one prayer request. We need some preachers to go to America and to go to South America and to go to Mexico and to go to the Netherlands. I I need need someone to go uh, uh, like like Sally McWaters who attended college with me who has an orphanage in Costa Rica who's been there for 37 years as a single woman leading children to Christ. She just said, here am I, Lord, use me. It's a call to go for God. God is looking for people through whom he can accomplish the impossible. What a pity that we plan to do only those things that we can do by ourselves. God says, I'll go with you. Lo, I am with you always, he says, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is a call to the people, to go to the people. It's a call to go for God who will go for us. And this is a call that is an invitation. That is to say, God will not force someone to do his work. God's not going to force you to be a preacher. He's not going to force you to be a preacher's wife. He's not going to force you to be a Sunday school teacher or a Christian school teacher. He will not force you. It's a call. It's an invitation. But he will not force someone to go in the ministry. 
I don't want to force or manipulate one teenager in this room to surrender to the call of God because we don't need someone getting in the ministry and then blowing it and messing up. But we sure need God called young people to answer that call. And by the way, God is still calling. But American teenagers haven't been answering. Their iPods are so loud they can't hear God. They're on social media so much they're too busy to hear God. They're so worried about what others think about them, they're not hearing. Listen, it's not that God isn't calling, God's still calling. It's that we are not answering the call of God. God is calling. He's calling us to go to the people. He's calling us to go for Him and represent Him. He's giving us an invitation. We see the call of God to go, but notice also the call of God accepted by God. Isaiah, the Bible says here in verse number 8, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Now teens, look right here. Sometimes people think, well, if I say yes, then I have to tell my mom. Then what does this friend think? Then, then there's Bible college. Then there's money. Then there's a job. Then there's, and ultimately, where do I go? And yes, there's a thousand questions between now and when you're out there full-time serving God. But let's not overcomplicate it. It really starts this simply. It starts right here. Here am I, Lord. You just believe that he'll help you tell your parents. He'll help your friends to understand it. If they don't, that's cool too. He'll provide the finances. He'll provide the direction. But all you've got to do is just say, here I am, Lord. I'll go. I don't know exactly where you want me to go. But here's the steering wheel. You take it. I'll follow wherever you want me to go. Then said I, here am I, send me. Now notice a couple of things. Notice, first of all, this is very personal. Isaiah said, here am I. You say, well, I'm from a Christian home. Wonderful. But this isn't a decision your parents can make. Say, I've got a great church and a great pastor. I'm sure you do. But your pastor can't call you to the ministry. It's your decision. Here am I. I surrender, Lord. Here am I. Send me. Paul the Apostle said in 2 Timothy 1.11, I was appointed a preacher. I was appointed a preacher. It was personal to him. Uh, on the Damascus Road, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? It's a, it's a personal decision that every one of us must consider this morning. And I thank God for so many who've come to this youth conference, surrendered their life to the ministry, many thousands of them and many hundreds that have come right here to West Coast Baptist College. And we've seen God take that little decision. Here am I, here am I. And we've seen God multiply it. And it's a beautiful thing when we obey the call of God. I think of Jonathan and Elisa Ballou in Thailand and the decisions they made at this conference. Greg and Rebecca Fryer in New Zealand. Adam and Esther Friedenstein in El Salvador. Josh and Bethy Furren in Ireland. These, they didn't know they were going to Ireland. They didn't know how to pay their school bill. They didn't know where the money would come to get to Ireland. They just knew that they were 16 and God was calling. And they said, well, here am I, Lord. Whatever you want me to do, Lord, that's what I'm willing to do. They were 17. Here am I, Lord. And the Lord begins to direct and one's in Ireland, and one's in El Salvador, and one's in New Zealand, and, and Kyle and, and Abigail Gwynn's are in France, and Sam and Julia Hutchins in New Zealand, and Luis and Magdalena Mont Montano in Mexico, and Ricardo and Angela Portillo in Nicaragua, Chris and Rebecca Reed in Thailand, Jason and Cassie Tate in Honduras, James and Nina Kim in Irvine, California, Brandon and Alicia Knight in Japan, BJ and Arvizu Nibi in Romania, Robbie and Sarah Yap yeah, in Hawthorne, California. Hey, the list goes on. These are people that a few years ago said here am I here am I it takes faith but without faith it's impossible to please him I think of some that are seated with us this morning I remember when many of them made decisions like I'm preaching to you about this morning I think of Ben and Jane Youngren I saw Big Ben up here riding that cow the other night. What would possess a man to do such a crazy thing? 
the love of God and the love of teens. Here am I, Lord. You want me to ride on an electric cow to be a part of this? Okay. Here am I. Ryan, Cavan, I saw Ryan back here the other night with the teens from Newport. Jonathan Armstrong, so proud of all these. They made decisions that looked little at the time, but God is multiplying. I'm telling you, the people that brought you here, you wouldn't be here if they wouldn't have said, here am I. Brother Morris Enriquez over here, when he was a little seventh grade boy, always came up to me, preacher, let's go soul winning. What are you doing, pastor? Well, I'm walking right now, Morris. Why? Because I'm going to that building. Why? Because I'm going to teach a class over there. Can I go? Thank God for Brother Morris. Now he's got seventh graders with him. I think of Brother Joel Rocky over here. Brother J.J. Mord over here. Matt Miles and Noah Kirch and Tyler McFate and Richard Kim and Robert and Beth Elliott. Many, many others. In fact, if you're a graduate of West Coast and you're here with the group, just stand up. I want to see where you are. I couldn't remember all the names, but just all these young people here. Just stand if you're a teenager worker now or an adult, the pastor. All these folks, they made decisions here. Let's thank them for that. may be seated. It's just, it's just being obedient to God. It's just saying, here am I, Lord. My question to you teenagers this morning, who is here that will say, here am I? Here am I, Lord. I don't know if I'll be a youth pastor in Fresno or if I'll be a pastor in Fremont or if I'll live in the Philippines and it doesn't matter to me. Maybe I'll be the one that goes to the Netherlands and helps somebody know there is a heaven and there is a hell. We need to take time to contemplate who God is, to feel the conviction of our need for him. And yes, to answer the call that we will serve him. I remember as a teenager in teen camp and they preached about this and they talked about surrendering your life to the ministry. I'd grown up in a ministry home. I I wasn't sure I wanted that. I thought about being a forest ranger, a truck driver. I thought I could see America being a truck driver. Maybe a farmer. I remember that Friday night They preached about surrendering your life to the ministry. I remember going to that altar as a young teenager. Not really anybody else much noticed it, but but I knew what God was doing in my heart. God was calling, and I knelt down, and what I was doing there was I was surrendering. Palmer Lake, Colorado, I I knelt down. I, I said, Lord, I surrender. I surrender my life. And I'm here to testify to you that I'm so glad that I did. I'm so glad these many years later, these now 50 years later that I can tell you God is good and yes, there have been trials and yes, uh, there's difficulties in our country and, and the ministry's not always easy, but I, I would never trade what God has let me see. Thousands of people saved and, and the work of God in the way of missions and, and seeing works established for the glory of God around the world and I want to tell you all to the glory of God, but where did it begin? Again, with a 13-year-old boy saying, I'll go. I didn't know I'd go to Lancaster. I didn't know I'd go to the desert. And then God gave me just a patch of desert ground. I didn't know God would let us build almost $90 million of buildings here. I didn't know God would let us see tens of thousands of people saved and schools started and and a college started. I didn't know God would let me lead two congressmen to the Lord, two city managers to the Lord, council members. I didn't know God would let us touch our city and have a ministry like that. I didn't realize all where this journey would go. I just realized this, that that the, the, the world is full of sin and from the head to the toe of Judah they were rotten and God said, Isaiah, you're right with me now. Let me ask you this question. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, I will. I will go. 
Teenagers, despise not the day of small things. I want to challenge you this morning to consider that one prayer request of Jesus. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers. Every one of us should be laborers. Every one of us should serve God in our local church. But many of you should step up and say, here's my life, Lord. I'll surrender my life to your gospel ministry. Here am I. Send me. I don't know where on the map. I just know. Here am I. Send me. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the testimony of Isaiah. Thank you that he tenderly volunteered. Please bless this invitation. Please help me and help the teens in these final moments. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, no one's moving around. There'll be no piano, no singing. I just want to talk to you for a moment with our heads bowed. There is a God in heaven who's still asking the question, whom shall I send and who will go? And there are some in this room who've surrendered already. You're heading to a Bible college. You're heading to serve the Lord in ministry. God set that in your heart. You want to get the message out that there is a heaven, there is a hell. You want people to know that Jesus is the way. But I want to speak to those of you who are now saved, maybe recently saved. It doesn't matter when you were saved. And as you have heard this preaching this week, and now this question whom shall I send and who will go? I wonder if there isn't someone here like me who right at this moment would like to say to Jesus, Lord, here am I. You say, Brother Chapel, I'm, I'm just young and I, I, don't, I don't have a wealthy family and my dad's in jail or my mom's uh, got, a, got a poor paying job. Again, it doesn't matter where you've come from. That is not the question. The question is, will you go? And I wonder all over this auditorium right now how many in this room you've been saved and you've been listening and hearing the preaching and God's been touching your heart, your mind, your lips. God's been cleansing you and preparing you. And now this morning, is there someone who'd say, Brother Chapel, I believe God is calling me to go to serve him in ministry and I don't want to quench the spirit. I want to be willing to do what God would have me to do. I don't know where I'll wind up. I just know that I need to say, here am I, Lord. Send me. Send me. I wonder all over this auditorium how many teenagers would say, here am I, Lord. Send me. If God has spoken your heart, and if you're willing to say, send me, would you lift your hand right now and hold it up? Just hold it up wherever you are. Here am I, Lord. Here am I, Lord. I'll go. I'll go to my state. I'll go to my, this city. I'll go. I'll go. Keep your hands up. I'll just pray for you in a minute. God bless you. God bless you. If your hand is up, would you quietly stand? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If your hand is up, just stand wherever you are. Here am I, Lord. Here am I, Lord. Here am I, Lord. Who else today? Here am I, Lord. If you're standing up, would you just come up here to the platform and stand with me, please? Just come right up. Just come right up here. This is the invitation. Just come right up here with me and just stand right here like a choir would stand. Who else today? I don't know exactly where, where I'll go, but I believe there's a heaven and there's a hell. And I believe that Jesus is the way to heaven. Here am I, Lord. Send me. I will go. I'll, I'll do what it takes. I'll do what it takes. Who else today? Just come right up here, guys. Just stand right up. Take, maybe make two rows here. Who else? Here am I, Lord. Send me. If you're sitting there and God is speaking your heart, you come. Don't say no to God. If you're up in the balcony, you might be a Bible college student just here doing your one-year duty, and God is speaking to you now. God is speaking to you that it needs to be more than that. If God spoke to you, you can come. Here am I, Lord. Come on up here, kids. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Just come right on up here. Send me. Is there someone else that needs to come? I want to do what God wants me to do. Here am I, Lord. Send me.
with our heads bowed and eyes closed. I want each and every one of you in this auditorium to be in prayer. I want to speak to those of you here on the platform. Look right here if you're up here. Young people, this is such an important decision. Most important decision in life is when you get saved. That's the most important. Probably the second is when you get married. You don't want to marry a dud. You want to make sure you do it right on that day. This may be right there, right after that when you surrender your life to serve the Lord in ministry. And understand something, we're not talking today about pursuing a liberal arts career. What this is about is saying, Lord, I wanna serve you by taking your word to people who need to know. That's what, I'm, that's what we're talking about today. I, I wanna give my life to helping people know there's a heaven, there's a hell, there's a way to know that you're on your way to heaven. What a great way to live your life. And people need to know the Lord and the world has its message, it has its music, but God has us here today to focus on getting the gospel out. And so we want to encourage you today to understand the importance of this, and we're so thankful and so proud of each and every one of you. If you're in this room and you have already surrendered your life to the ministry, you say, Brother Chapel, I'm not up there because I already have made this decision. If that's you, I want you to come and stand right here on the bottom floor, right in front of me. Just come up. I want to pray with you. Brother Chapel, I'm already surrendered at, a, at another youth conference or something. Just stand right here on this lower floor. Someone might say, well, I don't think everybody has to go in the full-time ministry. And that's true. And I said in the message... It's an invitation. It's not, we're not forcing this. But teenagers, now look at yourselves. Look, you, you down here, look up here, and you up here, look down here. Let's just take a minute. What if all of you stay pure and have your devotions and stay in church, graduate from high school, get to Bible college? We'd love to have you at West Coast. Get through college. What if all of you, several hundred of you, what if all of you got out and began preaching the word and helping start churches and having revival campaigns and building beautiful choirs and starting Bible clubs for the public school children? What if all of you totally sold out to God? Don't make this decision and then in your junior or senior year just quit. What could happen? This is why we have the youth conference, because of the difference that can be made with your life. Don't ever turn back on your decisions for the Lord. And I want to have a word of prayer for these right now. And I want all of you to join us in prayer for these. If there's anyone else that wants to come and say, here am I, you come on up now, we're about to pray. All of you should pray. All of you should be yielded. Every single person in this room should be willing to do whatever God wants, wherever God wants, anytime. Everybody should. But I want to have prayer with you guys. I want to ask the Lord to bless you. And uh, let's, guys, let's pull our caps off for this prayer here, okay? And let's pray together right now. Father in heaven, I want to pray for these teenagers who are saying, here am I. These on the floor have said it, and they're reaffirming this today. They're standing here with us. These on the platform this morning so tenderly have come. They don't know where it will take them, but, Lord, they're willing to follow you. Some of them, Lord, they may have some rough things waiting at home. I just pray that if, if a friend or even a family member tries to discourage them, that they'll remember this precious moment. I pray that you'd bless them, keep them, keep them focused on you and pure in their lives and help them to get to Bible college, help them to get out into the ministry, serving you with their whole lives. Help them to learn the doctrines of the Word of God and to learn how to be soul winners. Bless their youth pastors and workers along the way. And I pray and ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Before all of these find their seat, would you join me in congratulating all of them on the decisions they've made for the Lord?
I'm going to ask all of you on the front level here, just go ahead and find your way back. And all of you guys that are up here on the platform, we want to get a decision card made because this is so super important. So everyone from right here over, okay, everyone from right here over, come down and uh, find some of these men and ladies that are going to be here on the right and, and just come on down off here. And guys, bring them over to the far right corner there, okay? So all of you on this side, all of you on this side, you're going to come over here. Do we only have two counselors over here? We've got a few more. All right, let's get a couple of you youth pastors jump up here and help us with this. And let's fill out these decision cards. And while this crowd is filling these out, Let's congratulate them. Would you join me in doing that? God bless you guys. Congratulations. Happy for you. Just bring them over here to the left, fellas. Some of you counselors move to the left there. And uh, we want to take just a few minutes. It's just going to take a couple minutes for them. But every one of these has made such a significantly important decision. And God had the question, who shall go for us? And they answered, here am I. And we're congratulating them. And I'm going to send them a gift and send them some information and also send a record to their home pastor as well because we always want to encourage and include the home pastor in every decision. Wonderful. Dr. Rasmussen, just have them kind of circle right around there and take a few moments to do that. I'm, I'm going to ask Brother Chapel to come. I think I saw him down there somewhere. And uh, here he is right here. And uh, I sure appreciate my son and the great work that he and all of our youth staff have done. We're like you. We just had Easter. We just had all these other things. And, uh, and yet, uh, all the videos came together and all the organization. And I sure appreciate it. And uh, let's thank Brother Larry as he comes right now to share a few announcements with us. Well, praise the Lord. I told the youth workers in our opening session a moment ago, it really takes uh, an army of people to pull off a conference like this. So uh, please be sure to thank uh, your parents who sent you, your youth workers who accompanied you, the bus drivers who drove you safely. And uh, there's so many people uh, to thank, but we're so thankful ultimately to the Lord for what he did here throughout this conference. So many great decisions have been made, and to that we are really, really thankful. Uh, we have just a few more moments together at our conference, uh, so let me give you some really important instruction as far as what's going to happen next. In just a moment, uh, we're going to take a break, and uh, before we do that, let me uh, let everyone know where we'll be headed. Uh, for the juniors and seniors, we've got a special meeting planned for each of you. Uh, the seniors, and this would not include the Lancaster Baptist Church seniors or juniors in this announcement. So uh, we've got something else planned for you. But for the seniors, if you're here visiting the conference and you are a senior in high school, uh, after we dismiss, uh, we have something special planned for you in our Kid City Rally Room. And if you go straight out the back doors and through the connector, you'll be in our Kid City uh, rally room, and we've got a special time planned for you. That'll start in about 10-15 uh, minutes. And then for the juniors, uh, we've got something special planned. Again, not Lancaster Baptist, but uh, for the juniors, you'll be in our choir room, which is directly behind me. So if you go through these doors, you can exit uh, through the glass connectors, and we'll, we'll show you where to go. Uh, and we'll have a brief time together. We're looking forward to that in just a few moments. Everyone else uh, will remain in the auditorium, and we're going to have uh, a brief service, about a 25-minute service that we're going to call our conference recap, and uh, we're looking forward to that as well. Let's all stand, and we'll have a word of prayer, and then take a, take a break if you need to. We still have uh, some conference merch left. If you'd like to grab some of that, you can use the restroom. Yep. And if you're over here to the sides, and counselors, maybe you can help me with this. After the cards are filled out, if you are a senior or a junior, if you're a senior making a decision right now, filling out these cards, we're going to head straight to the Kid City Rally Room. And maybe, counselors, you can help with that. And if you are a junior that's up here filling out a card, over to the choir room. And so we're looking forward to that. We're also already anticipating next year's conference. Hopefully you can come back. And we're looking forward to a great time uh, next year. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you have accomplished in our hearts and our midst the last few days. God, we thank you for the response that we saw from the very beginning. I thank you for how uh, this group in here has listened and received your word. Uh, God, I pray that you'd bless them for that. I pray that you would be with the decisions that have been made, the, the individuals that have made those decisions. I pray that they would now live out those decisions for your glory. I thank you for those who have been saved at our conference, and I thank you for those who have uh, surrendered 
uh, their, their entire life to you. God, I just pray that you would bless them for that. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be back in here in about 10 minutes. Listen for the music, and we'll get back in here.